Good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to see you and have you with us this morning. This is uh, the meeting of the Senate Ag Committee, and uh, we haven't gotten any more in January. But we'll be back next month, uh, that, uh, the 30th of uh, January. So um, it's great. We got folks in from the SNAP program, and uh, I got you folks listed on the schedule, but sometimes things kind of get out of order. So is there a particular way that you'd like to uh, have witnesses come up? Uh, well, I am standing in for John Sales today. So that I'll go first. And then I believe we have a person joining on Zoom. So whenever Corey is ready, I think we'll let um, Corey go second. Um, and then we'll have Joanna from NOFA and Sherry from the Brattleboro Winter Farmers Market. Does that sound like a good order, Chair Star? Sounds great to me. Great. Okay. Uh, so, good morning <clears throat> and, and uh, very welcome uh, to me. And <clears throat> as um, well, you have testified before. And, and uh, sometimes we're good listeners and Sometimes we find it and say, hey, I got a question on that. So, you know, we run that kind of like a little conversation. And uh, and if you have questions of us, uh, certainly, you know, ask me. Yep. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Carrie Saylor. I live in Linden, Vermont, and I work for the Vermont Food Bank. Um, and I am going to try and take as little of your time today as possible so that our friends who have joined us for SNAP Awareness Day yep. can give you their testimony and help you understand all of the different ways that SNAP touches our communities. Um, we were here last year to speak to you, but I will give you the reminder of what SNAP is um, because it's a complicated federal program that we're really fortunate to be able to take advantage of here in Vermont. Um, SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and it's actually called Three Squares Vermont here in Vermont, the, the government lives as, as every state choose its own adventure uh, and name it itself. Um, here in Vermont, it's administered by the Department for Children and Families Economic Services Division. Um, we work closely with them. Um, the food bank has its own SNAP application assistance and outreach program, and so some of my colleagues work directly with individuals and communities across the state to work through the complicated SNAP application process. Um, Vermont is uh, actually one of the better states to have SNAP benefits in. The federal limit on SNAP benefits is 130% of the federal poverty le level. Vermont uh, allows for 185% gross income and then there are a number of deductions that if people net down to 130%, they're eligible for the program. So it's a process. And what, what does that equal out at in dollars, 185? It's about $55,000 per year for a family of four, um, or about $4,625 per month. And it is, it is judged on a per month basis. Um, and if people's income goes above that in a month, they are no longer eligible for those benefits and need to reapply. For that month or for the whole year? For the month. Yeah. So people drop on and off this oh, help, right? If so they're at they, that income limit. Yeah. Yeah. Which is part of the complicated factor. Yeah. Um, I would think, you know, I could see if they were over for a couple of months. Uh, uh, then they have to reapply. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, jury applied. So there must months. be paperwork involved and it is a complicated application process. It is many, many, many pages with lots of detailed information about household income um, and expenses. Very uh little invasive, we'll call it, uh, for people who, you know, to just receive food, essentially. SNAP benefits can only be used on food items. They are not eligible for household products hygiene products, um, and at this time, you cannot use them to buy hot prepared food. So the rotisserie chicken in the grocery store that's pre-cooked, that's, you know, seven bucks, it's easy dinner for everyone. You cannot use SNAP benefits to buy that. 
because it is considered hot food. And there's a little line in the federal statute that says this may not be used for hot prepared meals. We are working with our federal delegation to try and have that removed sure. from part of the farm bill reauthorization sure. process. The other day, they were for 459 at the store. We'll all be coming to your groceries. No, <laughs> <that's good. laughs> um, in Vermont, uh, Three Squares serves about 68,000 people in about 40,000 households. So it is a really broadly used program, and a lot of people access these benefits. A household who's at that upper threshold of about uh, you know, 185% of the federal poverty level will receive the minimum benefit. So for a household of one, that's $23 a month, which is not many of those chickens or anything else, um, but it is something. And so part of what we're bringing to you today are requests related to both SNAP benefits and the programs that are filling those gaps for people. And there are a few. So the food bank is requesting $5 million in base funding through the appropriations process to help fill those gaps for people who receive SNAP and also those who are not eligible for this program to receive food at their local food shelves and food pantries. Um, the area agencies on aging are requesting $2 million in base funding for the Meals on Wheels program, which provides prepared meals. SNAP can't be used to purchase prepared meals. And a lot of older adults rely on that program for home delivered prepared meals. So that is a complementary program where people could use their SNAP benefits. So they can't the use them now for home delivered meals? There is no home delivery meals option for SNAP, but hold on to your hat. I've got a little more information. Um, the uh, S15 bill was just introduced in Senate Health and Welfare by Senator Ruth Hardy. And that seeks to establish a restaurant meals program for Three Squares Vermont here. And it would direct the state agency, the Department for Children and Families Economic Services Division, to introduce a transition plan to increase the SNAP minimum benefit and to um, hire a position that would create this restaurant meals program for the state. It's a federal option that Vermont has not taken advantage of yet. So we do have the opportunity to create the option program in Vermont, but it requires some capacity and infrastructure in DCF um, to do that work. And that would allow people to purchase prepared meals from participating restaurants, and it would establish the rules and um, access to that program. So, uh, so those, we don't know then how it would work because they haven't developed the rules. No, and it's just in Bill Foreman at 15. So hopefully we would develop the rules if we were given that option. Yes, state. we as a state. Yes, the state. Um, and and we would have to decide is the is there a position that's part of ESD? Are there other agencies that are involved in that because it involves restaurants? So would ACCD be involved? There are some details that need to be worked out as part of that. And Senator Hardy is the best one to talk to about those options in that and that program. And the amount of what would the feds pay on something if we if we uh, were allowed and we got the option? Is there a maximum dollar spent? Or? It would allow people to use their SNAP benefits that okay. they currently receive in a different way. So there, I don't. I, there's no federal. There's no additional federal funding for that. But it gives people the flexibility that they need to purchase a restaurant or prepared meal. If they are unable to, you know, cook for themselves, and there's lots of reasons why people need that prepared option, and actually Sherry has some good examples of that for her, her farmer's market, um, allowing people to purchase prepared food there. Um, and then the fourth request, which also relates to um, farms and farmers markets, is that NOFA is requesting um, $478,500 in base funding to support the crop cash and farm share program. And that is a way for people to utilize their SNAP benefits and have those benefits be matched by crop cash so that they can purchase more from local farms and local vendors at their own farmer's markets. And one of the challenges that we run up against, if you're thinking about those folks who receive $23, is that that's not going to go very far at a local farmer's market. But the farmers at those markets need to be paid and receive money for the food they're growing. This is a program that helps to bridge that gap to allow low-income Vermonters to have the same access to locally grown, nutritious Vermont food. Um, and 
those are sort of the the main requests in front of you. And I'm gonna I'm gonna basically step out of the way <laughs> and let my friends um, who joined me today yeah. explain a little bit. They, but before you do, um, what's the current funding base funding for both the food bank and the uh, Meals on Wheels program? Um, the food bank receives no money in base funding. We okay. have received one time appropriation. Okay. So you want five million there? And yes. what about meals for wheel, uh, meals on wheels? Meals on wheels received one million in base funding last year, and that uh, they're asking for two total. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Any other questions from committee members? No. No. Thank you all uh, for your time, and I'm going to stay here and can help answer questions. Yeah. Um. But I will allow folks to go next if. Is Linda, is Corey signed on? Yes, he is. Okay, great. So Corey will join us. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Good morning. Can you hear us? Hello. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, Senator Starr, should I go ahead? Pardon? Shall I go ahead with my testimony? Yes, welcome, and uh, yeah, the, our time is your time. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for hearing my perspective today. My name is Corey Froning. My pronouns are she, her. I live in Richmond, Vermont, and I am a farmer, a social worker, and a University of Vermont graduate student. I'm working to open an on-farm therapy practice where people can incorporate movement on the land, such as walking or gardening, as a part of their therapy. While I am a student, putting my time and money towards developing this necessary community health resource, Three Squares is supporting me to nourish myself until I graduate and I'm able to secure an income again. When I moved to Vermont in 2017, I worked in various social work positions, including at Spectrum, Center Point School and Steps to End Domestic Violence while farming on the weekends. During this time, I was working 50 hours per week for less than a living wage and was just able to cover my expenses. The pace and financial stress affected me mentally and physically. I experienced daily chest pain and heart palpitations. When COVID hit, I transitioned from full-time social worker to full-time farmer at Bread and Butter Farm. With a fairly standard farm salary of $20,000 per year, I saw this shift as an investment in my mental and physical health. At Bread and Butter, I had access to the most nutrient-dense food, dark leafy greens, grass-fed meat, fresh herbs, but I still struggled to pay my bills, including my grocery bill. While farmers have access to beautiful local food, they still need to purchase most of their staples. Staples in my kitchen that I do not produce include rice, oil, peanut butter, bread, dairy, nuts, chickpeas, lentils, coffee, etc. While I am fortunate to have local greens and meat in my own backyard, the monetary value of that food does not make up for the low wages that I and many farmers face. I still struggle to afford grocery staples. Three squares and Vermont food access programs, such as Crop Cash, Farm Share, and Meals on Wheels, not only support farmers by giving recipients economic power to access their local food, but also supports farmers with low incomes to feed themselves and keep doing their crucial work. In 2021, I started the Farm Upstream LLC with four business partners. For three seasons, we leased land and grew vegetables. Our goal was to get established, create sustainable systems, form relationships, and break even while we searched for affordable land. The farmland outlook was bleak, with few farms for sale in our area and most selling for a million dollars or more. Though it wasn't on the market, we had our eyes on an old dairy farm in Jericho with 20 acres of agricultural soil and a stream. It was perfect for what we imagined, a community fruit and vegetable farm with an on-farm therapy practice. In 2023, last year, after years of financial planning, collaboration, and fundraising, 
The farm upstream bought and conserved that farm in Jericho with the support of the Vermont Land Trust and the Jericho Underhill Land Trust. In the fall of 2023, this past fall, I also began the University of Michigan Master of Social Work program in pursuit of becoming a licensed independent clinical social worker with the ability to open my own on-farm therapy practice. This has been an enormous financial undertaking. In order to invest in my future, I am in a full-time graduate program that requires two years of unpaid internship on top of the course load. The required unpaid two-year internship is ubiquitous across US Masters of Social Work programs, and it is what kept me from pursuing this Master of Social Work for so long. This requirement means that I only have time to work a part-time job one day per week, which earns me only $500 each month. With a mortgage to pay, $45,000 owed in tuition, a loss of income, it is impossible to cover my expenses, including groceries. I have been reliant on my business partners for support during this time, which is a part of our resilient collaborative model, but I cannot rely on them for everything or for too long. I applied for three squares when I started school in September, before I knew what this new financial stress would feel like. I am so grateful I applied and for the support that three squares offers me to take one financial worry off my plate and put food on my table while I invest in my education, my future, and my community. Three Squares offers physical and mental relief when I go to the grocery store, and I know that I can feed myself while I am in school. I know that many of my classmates, fellow farmers, and clients alike could benefit from this relief of not being physically stressed about feeding themselves, especially when both farmers and social workers are trying to help nourish others. Three Squares is a crucial program. It supports people like me to feed ourselves and make ends meet in times of transition. My request is for you to support the Food Bank's campaign, Give SNAP a Boost, which will expand eligibility for students. Current college and graduate student eligibility guidelines are prohibitive. Many students, even when they are unable to feed themselves, are not eligible. I am lucky to have fallen within eligibility guidelines, but I want you to know that many of my peers who are also struggling to make ends meet are not eligible. We all deserve to nourish ourselves and to be able to go to the grocery store without crippling stress and anxiety. The Give Snap a Boost campaign would ensure that more Vermont students are well fed and can better focus their attention on their education and their future. Thank you for listening and for your consideration. I recognize I shared a lot of complex information and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> Thank you, Cory. Uh, questions from me. Uh, could you elaborate a little on, you said you had some friends that would not qualify. Was, is there a particular issue that in the regulations or is it they earn too much or too little or why why don't they qualify? Sure. Um, Carrie might be able to answer this question better, but the answer that I can give um, is that from my perspective, the regulations um, around qualifications for three squares for students um, are quite dated. And my understanding is that they make the assumption that if you have enough money to go to college, um, that you have enough money to pay your bills, including your grocery bill. Um, but we all know that's not the case, right? I am a in-state University of Vermont student and I'm going to have $45,000 of debt. Um, and uh, specifically for college students and graduate students, there is a 20, I believe it's 20 hours per week work requirement in order to qualify for three squares. Um, and that work requirement, the requirements around that are really strict as well. So um, any work that is related to the university or is an internship or a work study does not count towards those 20 hours a week work requirement. 
Um, so yeah, it, I mean, most most students that I know cannot afford to work 20 hours a week as a full-time student on top of work, study, and internship. Um, it's just not doable. Not enough hours in a week. Right. And must be you'd have to work, you know, a certain number of hours besides your work study uh, to qualify. Is that a, a federal requirement or a state requirement? So it is a it is a federal rule that students must work. Um, 20 hours a week, but the state of Vermont has chosen to interpret that rule that it applies to all students. There are other states who have interpreted that rule so that it does not apply to students who are doing qualified job training or work training. So part of S215 has an element to it that would um, encourage the state administration to take a looser interpretation of that, not really a looser interpretation of that rule, like a reinterpretation of that rule that would give more students access to SNAP benefits. And that is something that the state administration can, can do on their own without any legislative requirements or any federal waivers. Yeah. I would think, you know, if your work study requires you to do 20 hours of work or whatever it is, if you could bump that to 20, that would be part of all of it. Chair Starr, you are, you are coming up against some of the illogical nature of the rules around this program. And some of the rules and functions of SNAP are not, don't necessarily make logical sense. Um, I do have some information about the Give Three Squares a Boost campaign in the folder, and that has some more details that might be helpful to you. And Hunger Free can really answer all of the detailed details, and um, I'm happy to connect you with Teddy, and you can you can have that conversation with with he and his team. Um, I'm I'm like the fifteen thousand foot view. Yeah. Um. And uh, are there any questions from members? No. Um, and you might wonder maybe why I'm asking uh, the, these questions is because uh, eventually that issue is going to come up in our afternoon committee. And, uh, you know, we could make recommendations to uh, the, uh, the money committee, which a couple of us sit on. So, yeah. Might might all work, you know. <laughs> this is, you know, this is a crazy place. And how to how you get things done? Um, well, uh, thank you, Corey, and uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your testimony. And Joanna and Matt. Uh, morning. Welcome. Morning. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair Starr, for having us here today. My name is Joanna Doran. I live in Winooski, and I'm the Local Food Access Coordinator with the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, also known as NOFA Vermont. Um, today, I'm here to talk about how SNAP is important in making sure that dollars are spent locally um, and connecting low-income Vermonters with farmers. Um, and specifically, our crop cash program um, and farm share program that we run at NOFA um, help connect SNAP recipients with local farms. Um, I'm going to try to leave enough time for Sherry to talk about how crop cash operates specifically um, at her farmer's market, but I'll give a brief overview of the program. Um, and our main ask is for the legislator, le legislature to support NOFA Vermont's request for $478,500 in base funding for the crop cash and farm share programs. Um, at NOFA, I coordinate these programs, um, which will provide financial assistance for low-income Vermonters to purchase local food directly from farmers. Um, these statewide programs are truly a win-win because with every dollar that we provide to 
um, a Vermonter who might not be able to purchase local food otherwise, that dollar goes directly into a local farmer's pocket. So in that way, um, these programs support food security and provide a reliable, uh, fair price for um, farmers' products. The crop cash program um, doubles three squares Vermont or SNAP benefits when they're used at farmers' markets so that SNAP recipients can get even more food at the farmers' market. Um, through a one-time legislative appropriation in 2023, we were able to expand the crop cash program, which is typically only able to be used to purchase produce. Um, we expanded that program to be able to purchase any SNAP eligible food. So folks could spend their three squares Vermont dollars at farmer's markets and get extra coupons to spend on things like dairy, um, proteins, eggs, you know, things that make a full diet. Is that is that how the double works out with getting double from your SNAP program? Yeah, so um, someone can go to a farmer's market, spend um, a dollar of SNAP, and then they would get an additional yeah. dollar of crop cash to spend on produce. And this past year, we were able to give them another dollar to spend on any other SNAP eligible food at the market. Sure. So then the dollar you get to it. Exactly. So especially for the guy that the person that only gets 20, yeah. 20 odd dollars. You're exactly right. So it's basically tripling the amount of dollars that they receive from the SNAP program. Um, and people had the same reaction that you did. They loved this program. Um, once folks realized that they could actually, you know, purchase food at farmers markets, um, it made it worth it for them to spend their SNAP dollars locally rather than going to Walmart um, or a large, you know, supermarket. Um, so this program was so popular um, for both SNAP recipients and for farmers who were receiving that money that we um, used up all of our funding in just five months. And we had planned for that program to last all year. Um, so of course that was an incredibly hard thing to do to pause the program after just five months. Um, but we were able to basically triple the amount of dollars that was circulating um, across farmers markets throughout the state um, through the crop cash and the additional crop cash plus program. It also encouraged more SNAP recipients to use their dollars at farmers markets. Um, so we also heard from vendors at farmers markets that um, these programs were really incredible for them, particularly after the flooding in July. These were really important for um, maintaining a, a viable income. Um, some vendors even um, said that crop cash, the new crop cash plus pilot program, the one that allowed folks to use their coupons on meat, dairy, eggs, um, that helped some vendors that sell those products add an additional up to twenty percent of their income at farmers markets. Of course. Um, so the issue here is that. Crop cash is um, the, the way that it usually works by just funding produce um, is federally funded and it's restricted in what you know those coupons can be used for. Um, and the one-time appropriation that we got to pilot the crop cash plus program um, was one time. So we have seen how effective these programs are for increasing food security and for farm viability. Um, and so we need state funds to allow us to continue the Crop Cash Plus program and to, um, to help us keep Crop Cash at the level that it's at. So because it's federally funded, the grant that we receive funds through requires a local match. Um, so for every dollar the federal government gives us, we need to provide a dollar as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so you use like our appropriation for that goal? That's a really good question. Um, we could use that appropriation if we did not expand the program to be able to be purchased, that uh, be able to be purchasing food other than produce. So 
um, if we just kept the program the same and said uh, to staff recipients, you can't use these dollars to buy food other than vegetables and fruits, um, then that would have been a different situation. But we felt really um, strongly that it's important to expand the program to be able to fulfill a whole diet need and to support the um, agricultural vendors that provide those products. Um, so we are you know, looking to philanthropy to provide the match funding. And that, of course, limits the amount of the federal dollars that we can ask for because we can only raise, this, or we can only ask for as much as we can raise. Can, can you separate the expanded part of the program from the regular program so you could use all the uh, donated money to match the new stuff and use state money to match. Um, in a way, yeah, if we do uh, receive state funding again, we can use it to match, um, but it's currently not in the governor's budget. And so we need for it to be included in um, the Senate and House budget matches um, to be able to use that as match and to continue the Crop Cash Plus program, like you were saying. Uh, I would. Think that, you know, I'd sit here all day and trade a dollar to the three. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a pretty good, pretty good deal. Yes, and two out of those three dollars um, is is typically federal. So the SNAP dollars are coming from the federal government, um, and then the federal crop cash dollars that we're trying to draw down more of. Um, which would be helped out by state dollars doing that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to kind of wrap up here so we can get in a few words, but we just um, are very committed to these programs, Crop Cash and Farm Share, and we know that the dollars that are invested into these programs have a dual impact. They, again, support food security for Vermonters, and they support farm viability by making sure that farmers are paid for those products. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And I can take any questions that you have. Um, um, oh, do you have a little extra questions? Well, thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you. <laughs> so, Sharon? Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Starr and committee um, for hearing my testimony today. My name is Sherry Marr and I live in Athens in Wynn County. I co-manage the Broadboro Winter Farmers Market and have long sat on the Vermont Farmers Market Association Board for the GTFMA. I'm also a volunteer Meals on Wheels driver in Grafton and Athens. In that role, I've seen the types of extreme need and poverty that some of my neighbors live in, and I know that what I see there is only the tip of the iceberg. But it's from my seat with the farmer's market and my work with the uh, BGFMA board that I'm here to address you today for SNAP Awareness Day. I urge you to support, especially the request that Joanna was just uh, speaking about um, in terms of NOFA's request for that base funding for Crop Cash Plus and the Farm Share Program, as well as the other requests that are being put forward to you today by uh, the Food Bank. Um, and having heard Corey's testimony, uh, S215 sounds like it really needs to be um, made more logical and, and sensible. Um, so we're an indoor farmer's market that began in 2006, um, the Broadboro Winter Farmer's Market. We operate weekly from November through March. And since the 2019-2020 season, which as you recall was the just before COVID really hit, um, we've seen an increase in of 150% of SNAP transactions at our farmer's market. Um, we have many new customers, but we have many long-term customers who are on food assistance, many families with young children, many are seniors, and many have health challenges. They greatly value their access to more nutritious local food and the relationships that they have forged with our local producers at the farmer's market. 
over these four years, the SNAP dollars at our market have increased by 119%, <laughs> meaning that federal funds circle, circulating in our community longer. And when combined with the SNAP incent, and that was just the SNAP dollars that would be increased by 119%. So when you combine that with the SNAP incentives, like Joanna was just talking about, um, turning 10 into 30, we've seen a total dollar increase of 408%. It's translated into $49,606 of buying power over just 20 Saturdays last season, putting more local food on the tables of local families and more income for the farmers and producers in our market. Contributing to the health of the community and the um, vitality of our farms and small food businesses. While we celebrate the growth of food access at our market, we've also recognized that it's a potential threat should it suddenly disappear. And Joanna and I agonized over that reality come this past November when we were informed and then had to inform our SNAP community um, that as of December 1st, that one for, or three for one was no longer going to be available. And that's because you ran out of money? That's because the crop cash program that Joanna was just talking about and the crop cash plus ended. Our market, however, has its own equivalent of the crop cash plus that we had begun a number of years ago, which actually served as a model for crop cash plus. So at our market at that point, rather than one becoming three, we were still able to give our customers one to become two. Um, and then we actually went out and raised more money to try and replace the crop cash. So we are currently still offering one becomes three at our market, thanks to, again, philanthropy and support, Food Bank and Vermont Community Foundation and others. Um, so what I'd like to share with you now is some of the responses that we got when we asked our SNAP community for their feedback with this. And so these are quotes that we received from customers that week after the news came down. Um, one customer wrote, not long ago, my EBT benefits dropped and I needed to rebudget. I was counting on the farmer's market coupons, which had varied also, and now I hardly know how to manage. Another one said, Please, please, please reinstate crop cash. Inflation is causing me to run out of EBT early, and the coupons have helped so much. Another, it can take a lot of anxiety away knowing that I can get healthy food, healthy local food. Um, another one, <clears throat> as a mentally and physically disabled individual, crop cash falls only behind SSI, SSDI, and EBT in supporting my wellness. It makes it financially viable as well as motivating me to go to the farmer's market, which I otherwise could not afford. Crop cash provides me with physical nourishment and the intangible benefit of allocating these funds to my market community. I'm validated by this participation. Even in my hardest, darkest times, it affords me the access to life-supporting goodness. Please support this program. <clears throat> the crop cash boosts my family's EBT and makes money uh, and, and that money makes an enormous difference. It means I can afford to buy local and organic for my kids and support local farmers, which is crucial. With the crop cash, I'm much less likely to run out of grocery money each month. And it is an incentive that inspires many low-income families to spend the time and the gas to go to the market when they otherwise would not. It has a huge impact on our community, families, and farms alike. Please, please, please don't cut crop cash. And so I would urge you to support the request being put forth today. And I really want to underscore that the matching dollars that go through the programs that NOFA is speaking about are, a, a, I see them as a triple win. They make, they put more healthy food on local uh, tables. They support the local farmers and producers and they stay in the local community and the local economy. Adequate nutrition, nutritious food is critical to healthy bodies, healthy families, and healthy communities. And the more that that can be local, the more we all win. So I thank you for your time today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. Yeah, uh, um, Ryan? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just curious, this is a winter farmer's market. It is. 
So it sounds like it's set up a little differently. I'm from Rutland County. Mm -hmm. And I, although vendors might switch around, whether it's outside or inside, the structure that is the same in Rutland year round. Is there a summer market in Brattleboro? There is. And our market is a separate entity in Brattleboro. And we have a great relationship with the summer market. But when we, I'm, I'm involved with a nonprofit grassroots sustainability group. And when we started talking in 2005 about the idea of an indoor market, same year that Rutland, I think, well, they began in 2006, I believe, um, as did we. Um, when we began talking about that that year, that uh, the summer market in Brattleboro was very um, involved with purchasing land and some other things, and they just didn't have the capacity. So they said to our nonprofit group, go ahead. I see. Um, and that's why we were able to also then create the program because we could take the um, donations and grants for the what we call our Boost Your Bread program. And we've gotten a lot of support from the Vermont Food Bank to keep that going since that 2020-2021 season when we uh, really needed to struggle to survive the market as well as to feed our community. So is there overlap like yours ends and theirs begins the next weekend or is there's yeah theirs ends at the end of October ours begins the first week of November okay ours ends the last week of March they all get a month off in April mm -hmm. and then they start up again outside in May. Thank you. You're very welcome. Irene, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I heard earlier that hot food wasn't allowed to be purchased. Do some of these vendors offer hot food? You know, it's off limits, or is it from a farmer? So it counts as crop kind of shot. It kind of it, depends on where the bounds are. Right. And it's a great question. Thank you for asking. With the SNAP dollars and the crop cash profound dollars, it is off limits. Um, the money that we've raised through the Boost Your Bread program, again, with the support of the food bank and others, um, we, and it was actually the food bank that directed us in this, um, in this path, we have allowed hot food to be purchased in our market with that. And I'll tell you, the appreciation from so many people is amazing. And we've also, as you know, we've had a lot of people that were living in hotels through a period of time, and they could come to the farmer's market and get a good hot local meal. Uh, which was really so, so gratifying for them. It was really wonderful. Yeah. So thank you for asking. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, see a drop in your people at farmers markets because of the flooding or, uh, or a shortage of any kind of foods to be able so snap people could pay, buy it? At, Market. We haven't seen that so much in terms of crops available at our market. We again, we didn't open until November, so the flooding wasn't so much yeah. of a factor for us. Um, I'm sure that summer markets, and I know from the producers at our market that there were crops that were affected. And um, I know one of my primary producers had said that his summer product, uh, his summer produce, was maybe half of what he's had before for farmer's markets because of the impact of the flooding. Yeah. And, and he's in uh, on high and flat yeah. land where, you know, flooding wasn't a huge problem for him as it was for others. So yeah, yeah it was it was a big impact. Um, <clears throat> but another part of your question in terms of the impact of, of the, I thought you were gonna ask me actually about the impact of the disappearance of the crop cash. And we did start to see that within the first week of December. And then because we scrambled and were able to raise more money and then start to get the word out, we're slowly seeing our SNAP customers getting the word and coming back to get their one becomes free for our market. That's a, that's a good, uh, good deal. It, it is. Yeah. It is. And it's fun to be the person to tell. That to a new customer that comes. Yeah, to sure. Market. I mean, yeah. That, not you, not only that right. you get Make yeah. that call <laughs> one early. <laughs> you can spend ten, and we'll give you thirty. Yeah, yeah it's, it. it's a treat. <laughs> no, that and it. I mean, it, it must make a huge difference. It does for the individuals. It too. makes a huge difference for the individuals, and it makes a huge difference for the farmers and producers. That yeah, are, and they buy meat, locally grown meat. And with the matching funds that we've raised and with the Crop Cash Plus that NOFO was offering this summer, yes, they can buy meat, they can buy eggs, they can buy maple syrup, they can buy honey, um, they can buy bread, you know. Just no hot meals. 
Right. <laughs> and that that's kind of, well, hot meals. I mean, uh, roasted chicken. I mean, uh, yeah, you can get quite a few meals out exactly. of that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, whole chicken. I know. And then again, it goes to the logic that you were hearing about from, yeah. from Carrie. That's not a meal. That's <clears throat> a the chicken. It yeah. <laughs> happens to be hot that you can take home and but serve It's on. pretty easy to throw a couple of potatoes in. Exactly. To make it a meal. Yeah. <laughs> and a veggie and you're, yeah. you're good to go. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, Irene? So what's the logic behind that? But they just don't want people going into McDonald's? And using SNAP, I mean, what, where, how, did, how did we get there? My understanding is that the antiquated logic um, is this idea that um, federal dollars should, should be spent through this program so that people can get ingredients that they then cook at home. Um, and I think as we all know, that's not possible for everyone. Like people living in hotels and motels who don't have a living kitchen, mm -hmm. who may be disabled and can't cook, um, but still need to eat food. So it's, yeah, it's a very antiquated logic. Um, that's unfortunately still the regulation. I, I, I would tend to add, I think there's some stigma attached to that limitation that about worth and about being able to go out to eat out in a restaurant um, is maybe not something that someone who is needing food benefits should be able to access. Well, I could understand that to a point. To a point, exactly. <clears throat> but if if somebody had uh, roasted uh, roast chicken at the farmer's market, yeah. I mean, uh, that's a or yeah, you know, they might cook beef for pork mm -hmm. uh, on a rotisserie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it seems like that would improve the diet of individuals uh, and maybe you know, make them healthier. Mm -hmm. I mean, you buy your veggies now. I noticed on TV out of a jar. Mm -hmm. You see that where you buy your veggies and if you buy two of them you get the something else for free. <laughs> I haven't seen that. I, haven't seen no. that. No. I only get my veggies at the farmer's market. Well, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> right, right. <laughs> Getting them out of a jar and I don't mean they're fresh in a jar, they're yeah. pills or something. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. No, oh, it's actually a jar. Yeah. I see. And yeah, the next thing they're coming with is uh, Lab produced uh, meats and oh yeah, I mean yeah, it, uh, we're not gonna need any farmers pretty soon. Yeah, feel that's a right from the right in the yeah, it is right And God only knows. <laughs> uh, so, uh, any other questions? Did you? Would you like to speak? Or? If, I know we're over time, and I won't um well, take a minute. Still got. We still got a few minutes. Is that right? Okay. Well, um, hi everyone. My name's Katie. I hate to turn um, by your way. At least it's driven here. Yeah. Um, so I work as the local food coordinator for the Center for an Agricultural Economy based in Parkway. And I also manage the Harvest Farmers Market. This was uh, my past season. was my second season. Um, I don't know that it makes sense for me to read the full testimony that I brought, which is from one of our most regular customers. She comes every week. Um, but I do have a few printed, and I'd be happy to include them in the folder. Sure. Can them around. Um, yeah, I'm here very much in support of the Crop Cash and Crop Cash Plus program, which um, we saw double between the 2022 and 2023 season, just specific to our market. We... Um, we were kind of in the heart of the Northeast Kingdom, very much agricultural land, considered sort of an underserved population in a lot of ways, heavily impacted by the floods. Um, we had to cancel two prime season markets because Atkins Field, where the community garden and the farmer's market happened, uh, were inundated with water, and not even <laughs> park there, et cetera. So a lot of what we've all been talking about um, resonates very much. Um, I also, um, yeah, I wanted to speak to the prepared food um, sort of question in that, it, as we all 
um, like we're in agreement on, it doesn't very much make sense. Um, the two regular prepared food vendors that we have in our market, which is considered a sort of medium sized, um, offer really healthy prepared foods, generally um, like a curry, rice kind of Nepalese type food, and then um, more uh, Mexican type food. So anyway, it's uh, yeah, kind of mind blowing to me that someone could spend their snap dollars on a frozen pizza at you know the grocery store, but they can't come to the farmer's market and get a prepared meal that they can then share um, with the families at the market. Um, so I also want to express, I guess, uh, my support for the meals um, and prepared meals in restaurant. I'm sure, that that's um, yeah, and like I said, I won't read through this whole thing. Um, you could leave us copies. Yes, I'd be so happy to. And um, it's a friend of mine who wrote it, um, lovely woman um, who essentially just speaks to her experience of um, her and her husband are senior citizens, um, both disabled. They were eligible for three squares, then became aware of crop cash um, and have since basically uh, Transition. Her husband was a yeah. type two diabetic, morbidly obese, um, who is now the vegan shopping at the farmers market, um, off his medications. Total life transformation in a couple right. of seasons. Um, yeah, and they come every week. They're they're really lovely. So, um, anyway, and the, please feel free to share our experience with others in way in any way which might help it keep might help keep this wonderful program going. It would be great to be available at farm stands for CSAs. Etc. If it doesn't already, um, so yeah, I will send this maybe around an email form too, since I'll leave a couple copies. But then you guys have it um, mm -hmm. easily available and available for any questions yeah. about for any future. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. So, uh, questions from committee. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Thanks for everything you're doing. We are. We thought we were good. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. So, uh, uh, if maybe we got to five, five minutes. Oh, we got, yep. we got a, a crew coming in at 11. Good morning and, and uh, welcome to the tag committee. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves and uh, Stall, uh, let's start. Yeah, Brian Collimore, uh, Senator from Rutland County. Hi. Hi. Irene Roberts of Mid North, which also includes her events. Oh, great. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, happy anybody in the county. See everybody. Rich Westman, Loyal District. And I'm Bobby Starr from Orleans County and represent a few towns down in Caledonia County as well. So it's great to see all of you here, and Denise, we've run into each other over the years quite a few times. Yeah. And uh, I guess you're going to lead off this morning on the like, Champlain issue. Yeah. Well, first, I just want to thank you for um, having us come in. One of our charges um, as the Citizens Advisory Committee is to present our action plan every year to the legislature. Um, my name is Denise Smith, and I have the distinct pleasure of being the current chair of the CAC on the future of Lake Champlain. Um, and I'm really happy to be joined here by my colleagues, who I'm going to have introduce themselves right now. I'll start over here with Bob. I'm Bob Fisher. I'm the water quality superintendent for South Burlington, and I live in Barrie. I'm Laurie Fisher. I'm a CAC representative from Williston, and I'm also executive director of the Lake Champlain Committee. Yeah, uh, Wayne Elliott, I'm a resident of South Burlington, uh, consulting engineer with Alton and Elliott, and uh, grew up in Newport. And I'm Katie Garrett, staff support for the community. <laughs> yeah. Grew up in Newport on the farm. Yep. <laughs> yes, I did. My dad's grew up in Orleans on a farm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, generations. Generations. Oh, neighbor to neighbor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, was. The town of Orleans, the Bellavos, that lived there for years. So. Um, well, thank you again for having us join you and um, for your memory. We are here to talk today about our action plan. We really want to focus on the ag section and, and probably the infrastructure sections. However, if you have any questions about any of the other pieces of this, we would love to be able to uh, weigh in on those as well. Um, I think what I'd like to start with is, 
as we know, the climate is changing. It's not only impacting our downtowns and our uh, river corridors where there's built infrastructure, it's also really impacting our farmers. Um, and I'm sure you've heard that as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, many times on this winter, especially last summer, last fall, last better. They can't get out on their field at the same time. Yeah. They can't plan. And Eric Clifford is a member here also oh, yeah. here today. Yeah, Eric Clifford is one of our CAC members. Has been for years. For yeah. years, more than me, at least 15. Yeah. I think one of the things that we just want to um, acknowledge is really how the farmers are responding um, and how our agriculture community is really partnering with water quality right now. Um, we've been really, um, feels like there's been some mental model shifts that are happening kind of at the deep rooted level where the farmers are acknowledging and, and wanting to participate in some of the programs. We also know that um, specifically like um, pay for improvement programs or pay for performance prep programs, it takes, you know, five to 10 years for people to get on board and to attract meaningful participation from the farmers. So we just want to encourage, you know, any kind of legislative action to really support those programs going forward. Um, uh, we also want to really celebrate some of the Vermont Agricultural Water Quality Partnerships that are happening with the conservation districts, AAFM, uh, DC, NRC, and uh, UVM Extension. Um, we've seen some really nice progress happening there. Um, I used to run the Friends of Northern Lake Champlain up in our region, um, Franklin County, um, and there was a lot of work done by the local NGOs and conservation districts um, to work with farmers on meeting their needs, but also starting to think about how to meet the water quality needs of the region um, and in, improving um, our communities. Um, what we want to emphasize on your action plan um, today is really the um, that we want to support sustainable agriculture, consistent regulatory enforcement. What I will say is we know that ag is in transition um, and that transition started happening years ago and is continuing to happen today. Um, in order to do that, we need to um, accelerate the diversification of value-added agricultural products and support our producers. Uh, we, and in Franklin County, um, the dairy industry is an economic driver for our region. I think you all know that. Um, and, um, we, we really want to protect our farms, our farm economy, and our environment. Um, and to do that, we need to support farms through investments in the specialized equipment. Um, and there's been a lot of success with specialized equipment. So, I mean, it, I can speak to my region of the state and what's happened there. Um, we need to offer full funding of programs offered to the agricultural community um, and enhance infrastructure for local distribution of agricultural products. Um, so those are really what we see as needs to be able to support our farmers as they're making a transition uh, from the current state to future state. Yeah, yeah no till and yeah, no till working out pretty pretty well. Uh, Soil compaction continues yeah. to be an issue, but yeah. how how are we investing in and supporting? Um, our farmers and making the needed investments they need to make to be able to support injection, uh, manure injection mm -hmm. systems. Uh, now, do the your uh, St. Albans area do they uh, their conservation districts own any of that equipment so that if a farmer is not big enough to buy one of those machines, because all those are expensive. You can have extension up where we live with the direction of Heather Darby um, has a lot of that equipment or has, has received grants to purchase that equipment. Yeah. Um, and I think our conservation district supports that as well. Um, but yeah, and I think at different regions of the state, there's different partners that partner with people. Yeah, yeah. but no, you're right, the no-till equipment and uh, that is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is the uh, full funding in the governor's recommended budget? Do you know? I'm going to look to my partners, and I do not know. It's still funding, full for, funding for what well, specifically? Well, in your piece here, it says uh, full funding of programs offered to the agricultural community. So I didn't know whether that missed. Yeah, any, there was a piece in the budget that reflected that. A lot of that running, I think, comes right through the ag. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, 
It's a great question. Yeah. We're we're gonna have to change sides. You know, yep. Because a lot of the grants were set up from one time money, mm -hmm. you know, federal money. So we've got to pay a lot more attention to that because the train doesn't come to the money. It's like we're gonna be facing that issue of this year. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Yeah. I thought some of these ones were dedicated to us. The formula is just that we were set up more than before COVID and before the federal. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have the in and Yeah, we should have somebody in here. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that we are asking for is to revisit the 2017 memorandum of understanding between the Agency of Natural Resources and Ag and markets um, to update expectations and clarify responsibilities, improve communications, and establish accountability metrics. Um, there has been more work done between AFM and DEC, and we've noticed some improvement in communication. I, we still feel like the people on the ground are a little confused, though. So, um, in terms of who's doing what and um, who they need to go to. Um, but there has been improvement, I would say, under the Scott administration and the work that's been done currently between the two agencies. But it's just something we always want to pay attention to um, and make sure that we're tracking and confirming. At one point, um, the CAC and others in the state really wanted to separate um, that relationship between DEC and AAFM and just give everything to DEC, including the regulation of the farms. Um, and um, now we're really wanting to just make sure that the memorandum of understanding is still working well um, for both the agency, of, for the farm, basically for the farmers. So the farmers know what is expected of them, uh, what they need to do. Um, and how they can help reduce the phosphorus loads to make sure. Yeah, them. that. <clears throat> And I think collaboration, in my mind, is much better than um, separation. Oh, yeah, that DC basically wanted to steal all that authority. And farmers, I mean, they would get in line down here to come in and beat up on that because the, the ag agency, uh, they... And, and if you go from the ag agency to the conservation districts, you know, at, they love the conservation districts and get a lot of good work done through them. And you say, well, why do you like those folks so well? Well, it's because they don't come in with a big stick and, yeah. and beat up on them. And they talk the farmer's language. So then you go to the Ag Department, and that's way better than it used to be. Uh, you know, they come in and, and work with with us and help us correct anything that we're doing wrong. And D.C. never worked. I haven't had a, one farmer contact me and say, boy, those are great people. They were here and they really helped me do this. And then they they tell you, well, keep them away from from me. It's all they want to do is find us and and uh, you know they don't help you straighten out the issue. So no, I think all of that crew should work together and and, and it's like everything else. Uh, our position has evolved. I've been at the CAC for over 15 years, and I believe, you know, it generally doesn't evolve a lot like aquatic bases. I mean, you know, we, you know, we're the three. We're Quebec, New York, and and and, and uh, Vermont. And uh, but we have, you know, we're a group, so it's a consensus when we come at this. We don't yes. all agree the same thing. And I'll certainly say that previously we were like, there was a the majority was like, we need to get rid of the MOU and just give it to DEC. Our thinking has evolved totally where if you see here now, it's just more collaboration is what we're pushing now. More collaboration, not not 
not just about not getting rid of the MOU. And we're seeing, we're seeing I, oh, go ahead, Lori. Go. I, I do just want to clarify, I mean, we have emphasized revisiting the MOU. There are concerns with the way um, that has worked. Um, the dis, um, uh, the, the, the um, differences in terms of how ANR and AG operate and how they view certain definitions like a non-point source, which is really fundamental to AG enforcement. So I would say that's where we're aligned as a CAC, but you know, we're coming at this from different perspectives and it has been a long priority of the CAC to reinforce that coordination, make sure that that you know, ag um, um, requirements are being effectively enforced, but also, as you noted, Senator, uh, that there needs to be adequate staffing for both programs. Yeah, I, I want to just add my two cents, and I agree with the chair 100%. We, in this committee, and I, this is my eighth year here, so I've seen examples of when it would appear that the a and R group and the AG are almost at cross purposes, uh, unfortunately. And the MOU, I think, was an attempt to sort of deal with that meshing challenge that um, sometimes doesn't happen enough. Uh, and I just, again, I'm a big fan of the conservation district. So to me, they're at the top of the list in terms of, uh, you know, a farmer will welcome them onto the farm and try to help. And uh, I'd love to see us be able to uh, throw some more money in that direction because again I as Senator Starr mentioned they 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 solve problems together and so that's what yeah doing. that yeah you know, and and state government shouldn't work any different than this committee or your group if you you know if you work on an issue and, and everybody can kind of come to the middle you usually get a lot better results than, well, I'm going to stick with this and that's it. And by damn, if you don't like it, tough, tough luck. Those, you know, it doesn't work good that way. Yeah. Did you go to Washington, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, it's we, like, oh, they're yearly for the client. And everything. We know what comes out of there. Yeah. and. I, I just want to add one thing, because I don't think we talked about it yet, but we do think that we should have. The, the farmers and the people, the large landowners in the state, especially ones who still have land and agricultural use, um, can really help resolve some of the climate issues that are yeah. occurring in our state, um, whether it's for water attenuation or forestry um, or soil improvement to store water better. And so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for this committee to look at, like, how do we, whether it's, you know, ecosystem services that we're reimbursing farmers yep. for um, or whatnot. But I think that's another uh, thing that we, and, and climate is throughout our, our action plan. Um, but we do know natural natural solutions uh, to, to the increased rainfalls. Um, and I'm going to turn it to Bob to talk a little bit more about ag or infrastructure. Or no, Wayne, mm -hmm. Wayne to talk a little bit more about infrastructure. Um, just because we, we do get healthy use of stats in terms of like water that just came down um, and, and how that impacted our, our state. But I think there's a big opportunity for agriculture right now. Um, to, to And they have come to as partner in water quality. And I think the climate change, they can help. There's so um, much you know, pressure. There's so, yeah, there's so much pressure on them. Especially if real estate values are through the road. I mean, you see, I'm a ski coach at Killington too. I'm just, well, baddest freestyle coach you'll ever see. Top mm -hmm. And your body today? Yeah, like I've that. used that forever. Yeah, no, that's been at least I've been there 23 years. I have been the oldest. That is true. Um, they're a very fit group. Uh, nonetheless, as I drive down there, you see there's this, you know, Vermont is the most septic tanks by population in the state, in the country, 55%. And, you know, a lot of these people are moving there and, you know, it's their building, they make mansions on a hill yeah. and they're forced, forced fragmentation yeah. more. I'm in favor of you know compact villages with farmland around it. 
I mean, if you want to take it to the extreme building and core, I've said this before, and if, you know, you build one building that holds a million people, you put us all in it with a closed loop membrane system, you know, out of like the space shuttle, you, you fix every problem there is. Now, do I want to live there? No, I live in a beautiful eight nine house. But that's building in, and then you can mitigate for PFAS, clear everything. You just all just fix right there on the spot. You have a few farms on the outside, you're good. That's building in in the extreme. We don't seem to be. We seem to be going the opposite way. The farmland is just so valuable. I mean, look at Eric. You know, he's seventh generation. His daughter's got a really good job in Boston. She's not coming back. So he's, you know, it's just they're gonna. There's gonna be more and more pressure, and as the land value just goes through the roof, yeah. You know, there's more and more septic tanks with more, you know, ground pollution from them. You know, PFOS, Everything's coming right into the ground right there. And, you know, they don't treat for that. That's that's land application on a statewide scale. Um, so it's just, it's, I, I feel for the farmers, they're, you know, they're, the pressure's just going to continue as the value of the land goes up and up, you know, good for them in the end, maybe, but no, it's, you know, it's like I live in Lake Tahoe and I knew people, the guy next door to me, he, uh, he stayed there for one more year and inclined his property taxes were 56 and he made 58. And he said, you know, cause his, his wife had died and his daughter was the, uh, uh, captain of the basketball team. So he stayed, he said, I'm getting driven out rich. You know, I have to move because I can't afford here. I'm out millions of dollars, but I had I built this house in Lake Tahoe, and this yeah. is where I wanted to retire. Now I also, you know, lived in Buffalo, and I saw the opposite. My buddy's dad bought a house for thirty two and seventy two and sold it for eight, so it could be worse. But nonetheless, the the pressure on the farmers and everything, and the increased stormwater from from all the land yeah. value was just I don't know how you deal with it, Arlene. Yeah, that uh, it it's rough and land. Uh, Time about water quality and trying to do the right thing. Uh, last year we we did a little pilot uh, bill in regards to virtual fencing, and yeah, you know, we talked about how it save the farmer money. Uh, he wouldn't have to go out every day and move his fence for rotational grazing and it would be better for the ground. Well, uh, we got a report earlier uh, this year on, you know, how did that virtual fencing work out? Oh, it worked out good. If, if we want to go over to the brook and fence that out, we, you know, put the line up around, and and uh, so the animals never go in the brook. And also, we have, yeah, you know, meadows will pond up and have ponds and wet. They could put a virtual fence around that wetlands so that the cow or the beef cows can't go in there and mm -hmm. tread that all up. Because cows, when on a hot day, love to stand in water and cools them down. It's like a dog fence or something? Yeah, it's it's this. I'm not familiar. Really what oh, it's uh, so all, so all, all done. They, they have, have a collar. They have just a collar. Just like a dog. And you put it on your phone. phone. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. You put it on it's your great. phone and you sit right in the office. And it uh, I mean, also has uh, little dots for each animal. Wow. So you can see where they are. So <laughs> if one should happen to want get Wander through on. the or things. Yeah. They can see where it is and and go and retrieve wow. it. Interesting. It's uh, the problem they they had, and I'm glad we did a pilot project. Is uh, to really be able to sell it. They to last a whole, a whole season. Uh, they need stronger batteries, sure, mm -hmm. uh, because they'd run they ran out of batteries uh, early, well in the fall, so. But, you know, you think about that, like we want to keep milk cows, all cows out of the brooks yeah. and to improve the water quality. I mean, that would, uh, it would work pretty, pretty good. I love the animation with that. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the type of thing that we're hoping, you know, hoping to see is more of that innovation and investment in the right. transition of ag, because that's, that's where... A place with bad water is worth it. It's, it's not. I mean, you can't give them yeah. away. You yeah. It's true. It's a farm in maintenance. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. yeah, do you want to come sit here with you? Not really. All right. Have a hot seat. <laughs> well, just 
just the one. It's hard to keep the meeting short. Right? <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about the uh, natural developed infrastructure. You know, this doesn't this obviously affects the ag side and affects our communities and everything across the board. You know, what we had the last six months just kind of reinforce, you know, the potential long-term impacts of climate change, you know, and our needed commitment to flood mitigation resilience. One of our priorities here you'll see in the plan was, you know, the state must continue to prior prioritize investments to support adaptive, resilient, combat cell and help Vermont communities. In addition to that, it's not just developed infrastructure, but we want to make sure we protect maintain expand the natural features because that's really where we can get the most benefit moving forward you know if we get this flood events we want to get that place of water and give a give a place for that water to go temporarily so it's important that we don't lose we need to maintain you know the headwaters the river corridors the floodplains floodlands and those buffers because we need to get the water a place to go we can't continue our past mistakes like we have in the last 30 or 40 years. We like it on Main Street in the state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I live buried. Yeah. Yeah. It's still a disaster. Oh, yeah? yeah. So some uh, facts of interest for the uh, July 9th and 10th floods. We had about four and a half inches of rainfall over those couple days. That buried a little bit around the state. Um, typically, so I'm an engineer consultant, we use like 2.7 inches of rain. So that well exceeded that, that criteria. Had 200 billion gallons of water and entered the lake. This is the one that's kind of probably the more disappointing, but just the environmental damage. You know, we made great strides in the lake with the phosphorus removal. The job the wastewater plants have been doing, the farmers have been doing. Um, about half of the phosphorus load. Uh, entered the lake on those two days of what we typically would expect for an entire year. So, mm -hmm. so you test it went way up. Yes. Yep. So, and of course, you're aware of this. We had 33 uh, municipal wastewater systems, about 19 community water systems. You know, we had wastewater infrastructure that was not operable for quite a period of time. Wastewater treatment plants that weren't functional, pipes broken, that kind of stuff. Fortunately, a lot of that's back to um, at least mostly normal operation. The lake level reached 98.3, so 100 feet is the flood stage. So that's pretty rare to see that happen, you know, if it's summer. Has it been that like before years ago? Well, or? so interesting enough, I'll just jump ahead here, but, um, you know, we thought we were out of the woods and we had this December uh, 18 event occur. Uh, the lake level went up two feet with that event, so we got up to about 99.1 feet, um, just barely up to the 100 foot. The lake level hadn't reached that level uh, the prior two spring, so it didn't get that high in May of last year, and it didn't get that high in May of the previous year, so just amazing the amount of water that comes in there. One of the things that we're kind of focused on as I was putting this together is obviously there was a lot of, you know, environmental impacts. But one of the things that really hurt the state, in addition to the devastation of the infrastructure, farm fields, um, you know, households, businesses, you know, the effects on the, uh, what we call the recreational economy, you know, we spent a lot of time on, you know, access to these receiving waters contact for re re recreation, swimming, boating, and everything like that. But, you know, we went through quite a period of time this summer where you could boat safely. The water quality wasn't acceptable to swim. You know, that affects tourism, that affects people coming out to visit the summer. And, you know, in addition to all the, you know, businesses that were out in areas of failure. So, um, I spent a lot of time at work working with um, the lines to overflow communities, worked with Rockland. And I was going through some weather data. We have these reports that are due the end of January, and I just these numbers just kind of blew me, blew me away. So this was in central Vermont. So we typically get 41 inches of rainfall in a given year. Uh, they got over 60 inches of rainfall. Yeah, uh, was is that it, total for the, the year? entire year? Yep. The difficulty with that is that over two thirds of that occurred from early July through the end of the year. So it wasn't, you know, typically when you look at that data, 
it all kind of evens it out. Like it doesn't get too far from that 41 inches. You'll have some drier months, weather months, but for, you know, to see that amount of rainfall in the last six months, it's just nothing. I've done this for 40 years, never seen any data like this. Dragon has a question. Thanks, Mr. Sure. We use a lot of, were ARPA funds used at all, federal funds to deal with some of these wastewater systems? They are, yeah. They are, and they're still being yes, used. They are, okay, yeah. um, great. They, that's a great program. Uh, it's funny it's being put into Virgin's Rutland, of course. I know it's such a huge expense. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that uh, yeah. was the thing with those, so we need to be mindful of is, you know, I've worked with these a lot of years. We're not going to eliminate them. Um, sure. Look at the events we've had this past year. We don't have enough time and money to really ever eliminate those kind of effects of those. It's not great. None of us think that's a good thing to happen, but from a water quality standpoint, those overflows occur in the rivers and everything else is great. And yeah. we're not in this, you know, any kind of contact. So we've got a lot of other aged infrastructure, a lot of other things need that we need to spend the money on versus spending millions and millions to, you know, up eliminate these overflows. It's beautiful to have. But that, yeah, I can see where Burlington's wastewater treatment facilities are down by the lake. Yeah. All downhill yep. to it. But you take like Montpelier, yep. uh, there's this up right by yep. the railroad yep. station. Well, all that water that came into the city, yep. if that if that had stayed in the river, yep. down to Bolton Flats or down south of here where the big meadows are and that, if that went on to that land and instead of over on State Street and, yep. and Main Street, yep. to think of the amount of yep. junk you're going to keep out of yep. out of that and it would filter out down on the, the big fields south of here. Yep. Um, and and you, we wouldn't have that problem in Montpelier, but... Yep. For some reason, nobody nobody wants to touch a river. Yep. They want to let the water run where it may. Well, yep. I'll tell you, back on the farm, if we didn't clean the ditches every 10 or 15 years, you had a lot of really wet farmland that you really couldn't grow good crops on. So you get the drag line in, clean the ditches, and you'd go back to growing good crops again, but... We have to be careful with some of that because a lot of things we can't do in Vermont, we never get permitted into in other parts of the country. Like I'm working on some of the wastewater plants for the flood resilience and it's like Johnson. So, the, you know, FEMA's there. He's like, well, let's put a berm around it or let's build a sheep by a wall. Well, can't do that here because what you're going to do is you're going to move that water back upstream. So by creating that solution, improving that situation, we're creating other problems upstream. So we need to be a little more careful and thoughtful about how we're looking at these mitigation resilient measures. Yeah, it's a shame that the, uh, I was the chief operator in Montpelier for many years at the wastewater plant here, so I'm quite familiar with, with the Montpelier system. When I left eight years ago, 23% of the pipes are pre-1923, but I run that South Burlington, we have two very advanced, because we have you know fairly wealthier community compared to Burlington, and we have two very advanced facilities where we microfiltration, we we, we produce electricity off our digesters, etc. Nonetheless, we're putting out almost drinking water, our phosphorus. We put out 340 pounds for 24,000 people because we do Colchester last year of phosphorus. That's that's like six houses of the septic tank. And I watched that. Extra hundred thousand I spent getting this down to 0 0.04 from our limit of 0.2 or 150,000. It's gone in seconds oh. as the river turns to chocolate. It's just, I mean, we're still going to treat to that level, but yeah, it's just, you know, in seconds, everything I did is just gone. <laughs> well, I don't want to hold you up. No, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, about 10, 20 years ago, Winooski was going to build a dome over, yeah. over the city. Well, maybe we'll yeah. have to build one over <laughs> all over the lawn. Oh, no. That's going to be the one. Uh, yeah, I waited for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I, I miss the days when you used to be able to go up to JP um, Thanksgiving weekend and have it 60 or 80 percent open. Um, the reality is with warmer temperatures, and this is exactly what's happening, is we're getting more rainfall precipitation. So the lake levels and everything are higher. Yeah. We're not getting the snowfall ball the so pack on the skier and kills me. I'm right up the you know, the middle of January, you kind of see bare ground. Yeah, so the point taken there is I I'm really hoping that what's happened the last six months is not the new normal, but it probably is somewhere in between. So the days of going back to where we just got 40 inches of rain, we got 12 or 15 events with half an inch is probably not where we're going to see going forward. So we need to be mindful of that. You know, I spend the money wisely and make good decisions on right. especially infrastructure, community redevelopment, and the ag sites. Just a couple of things. I know these don't really affect the ag side, but one of the things that we encourage, I know some of these communities are having a hard time getting papers. They're being uh, um, the money's coming slow. They're in a tough spot for uh, town meeting the governor. You know, sure that he's, you know, they're all going to be made whole and could reimburse, but it's just taking a little bit more time. And the other thing that's happening there too is um, they're getting close, if they haven't already, to that 120 million, they want to get to FEMA reimbursement, up to 90%, um, from the 75 to 90%. And then obviously, use those funds moving forward, you know, to address some of these medications like she issues with some communities. And we did a we did a bill uh, last week and the week before it passed it passed last week that if a municipality um, uh, regained uh, yeah, uh, blocks the taxes okay. if a tip, if a person goes in wants their taxes abated and the town agrees to it. Yeah. They aren't going to have to pay that to the end fund, so yeah. that that should help yep. some. And, yeah. and uh, I think that was a pretty good. It's also cash flow that a lot of these communities just have to come reimbursed yeah. into, and they're just well, been back by over the last six months. That's that's going to work out. It should take some time. Yeah. If we all paid our bills, <laughs> as good as the feds pay their bills. Yeah. We'd have a lot of business and people who are really hollering at us. Good. Um, I'm Any sure other questions? Did you want to, anything that you say? Anything you that you want to add? Yeah. Later. Um, I, um, well, where where are we with time? Because we we didn't give you an overview of aquatic invasive species in recreation. I can okay. do that very quickly if you're interested, but we also want to make sure we um answer any questions you have so. well, do you have uh do you have a uh, meeting that you have to not until one o'clock yeah not until one so it's really yeah we have lunch with you yeah. Yeah. we <laughs> locked you in <laughs> no we're fine now we've got you know if we get out at five up we're fine and so I, I will take much less time than that but just um hit some highlights in terms of Aquatic invasive species, as well as recreation, which are very much, you know, interwoven in terms of, uh, you know, the the potential effects that one has on the other, and also um, certainly climate change that everyone else who's talked about here has a big impact on both of these. So our priority for aquatic invasive species is to really reinvest and invest more vigorously in prevention because uh, we humans are the real conveyance for aquatic invasive species in terms of their um, how they get from one place to another. In Lake Champlain, we have 51 aquatic invasives. Uh, they have tremendous implication for ecological change. So more than anything else that's affected the lake, you've seen tremendous change by aquatic invasive species because they're sort of, their, their uh, profile as uh, a, a, a species is that they generally outcompete the natives because you know, if they didn't grow up in this region, they 
um, tend to have a lot of fecundity. They will overproduce their, you know, so they are going to, by the fact that they are often can exist in poor water conditions too, or in a full diversity of habitats, that often is one of the reasons that they have such a pronounced effect. And then the fact that they are such aggressive reproducers and they often prey on our native species. So again, they put much more pressure on. And uh, we are seeing at the time when you know, they're increasing. So we have 51 in Lake Champlain. The, we're connected. Lake Champlain is connected to all sorts of water bodies. We have more invasive species through the inland waterway system. So the connect the Hudson River, which is um, you know we're connected to through the South Lake Champlain and the canal system. Uh, has nearly twice as many invasives, the Great Lakes nearly four times as many. And of the species where whose origins we know about in Lake Champlain, more than half have come through the southern canal system. Um, yeah, um, we were also it's have an issue with stuff. the St. Lawrence, yeah, but remember Lake Champlain flows north, okay, and so you know, we're very concerned about that, and prevention is key. Once you get an invasive, because of that profile I mentioned before about how aggressive they are, they're usually here to stay. So then you're constantly putting in money for investment in managing them. So that's the situation, for example, water chestnut, an aggressive plant that's been in Lake Champlain since I think around the 1940s. Um, that we've been able, for the most part, to keep it at bay through ongoing managing and harvesting. There's both mechanical harvesting and hand pulling that happens. And as long as you keep up with the funding, then that plant is staying put below the South Lake. But for several years, over the course of many decades, uh, there was time when there, that funding wasn't kept up. And so the program was compromised and we've, you know, that plant has moved north. So now we have species that we, we have water chestnut where we're seeing in the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge and in other pockets where we're trying to really aggressively manage them. But that's just one example. If you lay off, you know, the gas on this in terms of investment, you're going to lose something. And um, Senator, have you yeah. a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'm sorry to, to yeah, interrupt, yeah. but can you say a little bit about that prevention when th when when ships, I suspect they're real ships, yeah. are coming up? Is there any from the Hudson? Is there anything well, that... Well, so Vermont DEC and New York DEC have been working, and we've been involved right. with the, there's how a, they operate the lines. There's, well, and that's one aspect of it. There's also a boat steward program. So yeah, right. and education is really key. So there's a, the Lake Champlain Basin program and Katie is our staff person, but she works for that institution. They run a boat steward program in New York and Vermont right. where they're at those access areas, prioritizing those high profile right. access areas right. to educate people about the prevention. Yeah. You know, everybody knows in terms of who has a boater gets schooled on clean drain yeah. dry yeah. and, and, but it only takes one person. Right. You know, these can get so in hard. by intentional, um, uh, you know, intentional of uh, uh, deposits of them. Uh, there's also, but also boat transport is really, really important. So that's why we're talking about, you know, our priorities are to have increased investment because we've lost staffing over the years. And we do not have the staff that can really keep up with all the education that needs to happen. So we're recommending a new funding source involving, um, you know, a boat decal for both motorized, non-motorized recreation, um, mandatory watercraft inspection. We do have some stations around uh, the state. Um, they're typically volunteer staff. So that's another issue is just, you know, the capacity uh, to do that, but there is funding uh, for both uh, from, I think there's a 50-50 split with Army Corps of Engineers funds to do a high profile inspection station near border area, which would be really important. So that's another thing we want to push 
and then potentially uh, considering a live bait ban, such as they have in Quebec. So you're avoiding all those vectors um, or trying to or trying to mitigate them to get at that issue. And then back to the canal through uh, the you probably know that Ram Gobi was discovered in 2021, very great, aggressive um, fish, a small fish that um, is um, one of the attributes of this fish is that it can, it feeds both during the day and during the night. So therefore, instead of reproducing once a year or less frequently, it produces reproduces multiple times a year. So there's great concern about that moving into Lake Champlain. And it is in the New York Canal system. So there's a high degree of focus on that. Looking at uh, flushing systems, they're now doing dual flushing. And now, instead of if you're coming up through the log system, as you were talking about, Senator Campion, you have to schedule your lock, and they are restricting that time. Uh, but we're very concerned, and some of us, my organization was pitching that we should temporarily close the locks until we can control this. Mm -hmm. So we're also looking at barrier dams. There is a study, and there was federal funding for putting in a barrier on the southern canal system, um, but we're very far away from in implementation on that. That's no point the round goby is not. Thank you. Yeah. There's the, more. Right. Round Gobi isn't in Lake Champlain, but it is a great door. concern that it could be, and it would be absolutely devastating to Lake Champlain fishery if it got here. So the bolt washing, that it doesn't happen it, all the time? No, it happens more voluntarily. This is also why the basin program, the boat steward program, is really important because at the access areas, they have trained stewards to talk to boaters, to do informal inspections too. They've run interference on some invasives as well. My organization runs an aquatic invasive patrollers program that we piloted last year on Lake Champlain. We're going to expand it this year, but all that is privately funded. We're funded through a, you know, a modest grant from the basin program. So but at the same time, we have lost funding in our state agencies. And what we have is one staff person and then temporary staff. So you're not building that capacity, that institutional knowledge. At the same time, in pressure from aquatic invasives is increasing and also recreational use is increasing and we want that to increase. And that's the other quick point I want to make if there's time, another pitch from our the CAC and our action plan is really to expand equitable public access and recreation. And certainly we support the BORAC and the initiatives there and that funding source, but really want to see a focus on, particularly in the South Lake and Lake Champlain, where there are very limited access areas. There aren't swimming opportunities. And our stewards, our environmental stewards, there's a direct link between your experience in the outdoors sure. and your opportunity there and your sense of stewardship. And you know, we really need to foster that, but we want to see a greater investment. Yeah, sure. May I just mention, I mean my limited experience is uh, between Maine and Lake George, they just seem so yeah. much more. Lake George, so you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not. I mean, in the lakes, yeah. I mean, you are not going to pull that boat out without exactly. people there who are getting paid, checking it. Absolutely. And so I, I do feel like we're behind the eight ball yeah. on this. We, we totally yeah. agree. That's why we're seeing a need for mandatory inspection. You know, that's it's you know it's a wonderful opportunity and privilege to use our waterways, but yeah. we have a responsibility and need to. Have our boats? Yeah. Almost out of time. It's also a capacity issue. Yeah. Like if you go to the Mallets Bay on a Saturday or Sunday, you got one person there. You got, you know, they're pretty wide with their boats. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. People yeah. are not very patient. So. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, the the last part of our thing is uh, contaminants, defos. Your buff. Oh, yep, sure. Uh, I'll say yeah, it really quick. Um, I'm sure. Uh, so I operate two uh, large wastewater facilities, and we produce CQ biosolids, I'd say. And um, I agree to, uh, to James Ellers, the pollution uh, network is here doing it noon, so I'm going to go get beat up over there.
Um, that's fine. Uh, but there's also, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, PFOS is the big issue of the day, but it's everywhere and it's ubiquitous and it needs to deal with. Um, you know, it's like, like I say, septic tanks has PFOS land application, you know, it's everywhere. The larger 55% of Vermonters, the most in the country by population on septic tanks, and that's not being treated there. <laughs> um, salt is the next one to come around. Chloride, people don't even realize that highly. There's probably going to be a TMDL, like hmm. new scheme, whatnot, force for chloride it continues to go up and up and up. I really was not that cognizant, even though I was a federal fishery biologist years ago. I talked to the stormwater people, and they're like, yeah, we're already reaching levels where it's starting to affect the fish. And well, 75% of it's private. So even like in South Burlington, where we have computerized things, we're trying to limit salt. You know, you tell a private person to do it, well, it's also a liability to them. They don't use salt, someone falls and breaks their leg, you know. So this is another huge issue coming along, and which was not that easy to solve. I mean, you put treatment on the stormwater facility. I mean, then now you're building like wastewater. Oh my God, that's expensive. I know, it's wastewater is expensive. And, uh, you know, like biosolids, your average uh, male of one, you produce about one pound a day for uh, about 186 pound male. So I probably produce more, I eat a lot. Um, but you can figure that's 365 pounds a year. It's got to go somewhere. And, you know, you, there's incineration. There's none in Vermont, never has been very expensive. So we pretty well wipe that out. You know, I could, we land apply now, but we're not even hardly going to agriculture. We're mostly going to uh, go with ECI. It's about a 5% mix. You don't even see the PFOS levels. Mm -hmm. And we went to the Swanton Airport. We're doing the Burlington Airport. We're doing I-89 because it's a fertilizer. Can't do that because it could have microplastics and PFOS in it. So fine. So now I'll landfill it. So driving five miles, I'm now going to put incredible amounts of greenhouse gas, dragging it up to Coventry where it's also going to off-gas, and then the leachate's going to come around. Well, does it, yeah, but it don't go away, does it? No, you put it in there and it's just going to off gas in there and it's going to, you've got to do something with it. And plus, if wow. you stop land applying it with like the farms and whatnot, you now have to import that phosphorus. Yes. So that's and more. You don't use gas. it in the first place. Well, it's mostly, they, come, yeah. I mean, they were telling us last week it's even in our clothing. Maybe oh, yeah. Well, oh, PFOS is everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's and real. And it's on top of Mount Everest, they found it. I mean, it's everywhere. But well, we're still here. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but, you know, it is what it is. So what are you going to do? I, I made this point many times. So you, you can't landfill. The leachate comes around, goes in there. You can't do that. So really, there's only one last solution. And because I have the intestinal fortitude to do what's right, uh, internal composting. I haven't gone like in a week, and I don't feel well. But... I'm looking for other solutions. I'm more than open. You can't landfill it. You can't land apply it. I that's all I got is left. That 365 pounds got to go somewhere. So you know, there's no easy solution. Certainly, if you just put it all in the landfill, there's landfill capacity issues. There's yeah. there and a huge increase in greenhouse gases yeah. plus all the importation of it. So there's no real easy solutions to anything. Well, in the junk, everything goes to carbon tree then. Yeah. yeah. A lot out. of it gets trucked back down to Montpelier yeah. here and over to over to uh, Plattsburgh. Yeah. But some of that runs down into South Bay. Because yeah. it doesn't matter yes. if you build a beautiful new swimming pool and spend hundreds or thousands and thousands of dollars, that baby's going to leak someday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, so there's no easy solutions, and really what we need to do is uh, help reduce the rainfall in this state. If we can do that in this committee. That would really help us out a lot. Well, the only thing is to do rain dances to get it to rain. I'll take whatever. Like, I'm a Killington coach, and they've already stopped all over time. They've already, because they lost Martin Earlier, really? they lost the thing. The Wally Barn's closed on Tuesdays now. The local people that are just trying to get by are all dying. Mm -hmm. Even though there's more and more people there, as crowded as can be, the rain on snow last Saturday, we got there at Frost, and all the lifts barely opened, and there was people all standing around. Martin Luther was worse with frozen lifts. And just, uh, they spent a lot of money there for pretty torturous things. At least I could pay the coach. But... My cousin owned the Wobbly Barn for years. Really? How oh, wow. I don't know how long you've been going there. I've been going there since, well, I lived out west for 12 years, but I, no, I've been there since the 80s. Yes. Yeah, Jack, Jigair. Oh, I think I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's my first year. Let's 
Well, I didn't get this craziness from. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, just a lot of, you know, more problems, contaminants, um, you know, obviously, and biocells are a huge issue. And, and if the solution is ship it somewhere else, you know, ship it to Ohio, so it's like, well, why don't you, that's no solution. Where are you going to send it all to Bangladesh in the end, you know, for incredible amounts of money? Good idea. Sure, I think they're already polluting that country pretty so, well. Uh, feel free to, feel free to. I have mom. Yeah, yeah. Really <laughs> so you've got that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go down the hall. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Any, any other really questions? For all? Thank you so much for sure. hosting us today. Thank you. Thank you. Us we'll come see you next year. Yeah. Committee. Well, you'll all be fixed. Let's hope they yeah. don't get as much rain between now and next year when we yes. see if we got this patch here. Yeah. 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 When you run a wastewater facility and you got. 34 pump stations. You, I look at my graphs. So when it starts to rain, I'm sleepwalking. Yeah. Oh, it caused me trouble. Yeah. Have a oh, wonderful day. Thank thank you. You. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, 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 thank you. And thanks for the extra time. Yes, yeah. 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 thank you. Thank you.